Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon here at Masterpiece for this panel discussion, Finding Inspiration in Collaboration, the story of an exhibition. I am Vivian Chow. I'm a journalist, and I'm a moderator of this panel discussion. I don't know if you have been to this exhibition yet, but the show, Inspiring Walt Disney, the animation of French decorative arts is a must see. I have just been to the show recently and it was such a joyful experience. It's not just a, a show, but it is actually a collaboration between two big institutions from different parts of the world. And it, it, it talks about um, something that we are very familiar with, animation from Walt Disney but at the same time also some works of art that might not, you know, we, we might not have a chance to see previously. So today I have a lot of questions for, our, for the curators of the show and also um, one of the designers who helped realize you know, the, the vision here um, in this version of um, the exhibition. So joining us today, we have Wolf Burchard, um, the associate curator at Metropolitan Museum of Art, who's a co-curator of this exhibition. Helen Jacobson, executive director of Attingham Trust, a formerly a senior curator at the Wallace Collection, and also a co-curator who worked closely on this exhibition with Wolf. And we also have Tom Piper, an acclaimed British theatre designer, who was also one of the designers of this show um, here at Wallace Collection. So let's start. First of all, I think I would really like to know, how did this come about? I mean, this, is, this sounds like a major collaboration that is going to take you know, years to work on. How did you two know each other and how did you come up with this idea in the first place? Well, um, so Wolf and I have known each other for some time. Uh, Wolf used to live in London. And you're right, it does take uh, several years to put something like this together. So it was probably about five years ago now that Wolf came to me at the Wallace Collection and said he had a great idea for an exhibition um, for the Wallace Collection. Could he talk about it? So we sat down, we had a coffee, and he said, Walt Disney. <laughs> at which point I thought, no, this is the Wallace Collection. But of course, uh, within a couple of minutes of talking to Wolf and, and hearing his ideas, um, the penny dropped and it became very, very clear to me that this um, was, was a super idea and a really um, new and interesting and stimulating way to look at the French decorative arts. So um, that was the original plan, but then, Wolf, you were appointed at the Met and things moved on. Yes, I, um, um, I moved to America, and having invested so much energy in, uh, in, in, in working with the Wallace on, on, on the exhibition, I, I said I was only going to go to America if I could continue to work on this exhibition. And luckily, I was able to convince uh, the leadership of, of, of the Metropolitan Museum that we too should mount this show. Um, so the decision was, was made to show the exhibition first, in New York uh, at the Metropolitan Museum and then subsequently here at the Waters Collection. And incidentally, um, it's going to have a third venue uh, at the Huntington Museum in Pasadena, so in Los Angeles, so in, in sort of Disney country, um, which, uh, which would be rather nice. Oh, so when is the, the third show, the, so the third show is going to take place? In December, it in opens December. in December, yes. Oh, wow. So, because um, this is, um, uh, a, well, I would say like a happy marriage between two very different disciplines that attract, you know, or that appeal to very different audiences and very different age range, I would say. Um, so how did, um, how did you find the balance uh, in between you know, these two very different disciplines? And how do you choose to narrate a story that is appealing to um, not just people who are familiar with, you know, French decorative arts or people who have the knowledge about that, but also to people who grew up with more just the animation but might not know about the history behind um, French decorative arts. 
Well, the thing is that when, as I was starting to think about, about the exhibition, it all started actually, so before, my, I, before I went to talk to Helen, I had dinner with two friends and who were both uh, specialists on 18th century art and uh, we were talking about all kinds of subjects and I um, told them about Disney animation. I, sort of, I, I, I always entertained a great fascination for Disney animation. So I was telling them about certain films, certain pieces of animation, foreshortening, etc. And they said to me, Wolf, you've got to do a, a Disney exhibition. Um, but, you know, I'm not a historian of the 20th century, and so I thought to myself, what can I bring to the table? So the starting point was, what source of inspiration did Disney use for his films? Um, but as I was exploring that, I saw that there were many more interesting layers in terms of parallels, for instance, in production, in, in this idea of pushing the boundaries of technology with a new medium. So one parallel that we draw throughout the exhibition is the making of hand-drawn animation, which is it's in its infancy at the beginning of the 20th century in the 1920s and 30s, and how the Disney studios pushed those boundaries and creating, you know, like a startup, uh, creating these studios completely from scratch. So when Disney founds the, the studios in 1923, he's by himself, and then it sort of gradually glows. And by 1937, he employs hundreds and hundreds of artists that are organized in a sort of very careful manner. And in the same way, um, porcelain, in, at the beginning of the 18th century, Europeans didn't know how to make porcelain. And uh, so in 1710, Meissen starts and then later Sèvres. And by the mid 18th century, you have these very complex organizations that have, that are workshops that are set up with a, a very strict hierarchy, uh, different artists with different skill sets. And we thought that looking at these studios through the Disney lens would make these more tangible. Yeah, um, and also for me, I think it's, um, look, going back to the object, if, if we look at the art that we are displaying in this exhibition, um, it too has a life, it too has a, an animation and a dynamism, and almost the story rolls out of that and meets this other story of, the, of what's going on, the parallel world of hand-drawn animation in the early 20th century and the correlation to the early 18th century. So it, it, it was a really exciting and stimulating subject to work on. The, the, the thing is with Disney is that it's so, uh, and this is a point that we made particularly in America because the, the, the Met, of course, is, is this great encyclopedic museum. This is the largest art museum in America. And to mount the first ever exhibition about this artist who was you know, arguably the most influential artist um, ever born in America is, um, is that he created a global culture and, it, and a lens through which so many Americans, and not only Americans, but people around the world, look at European art. And so I think, you know, you, we see that here on this poster, this is, this is a, a Sèvres vase that was made 250 years ago with, by, by uh, a group of artists working for Sèvres following a design by Falconet. It has nothing to do with Disney. But given the extraordinary global power of Disney, every other person who looks at this vase will say, this looks just like a Disney castle. And this is what we wanted to explore. That's really incredible because walking through the exhibition, there's, it feels such a, uh, a, a it feels like a, there's a great harmony of from uh, the, the the works on show and how they actually work with the scenes that you that have been shown um, or chosen to be to be shown, and it's it's an amazing uh, and it's an amazing experience to see how the hand drawn animation how they're being created and how they're being put together and how the stories are being told um, through this uh, really amazing audio guide. So if you go, you must pick the audio guide. Um, yeah, just interject to say the audio guide, we, we're, I mean, I'm certainly very proud, and I hope you're too. The fact that we managed to get Angela Lansbury to do the introduction Disney to the audio le guide. Disney legend Dame Angela, Angela Lansbury, yes. <laughs> who is, um, uh, who, who, you know, is of a very advanced age and gave her voice to the teapot in uh, Beauty and the Beast 30 years ago. So for 18 months, I, I tried to, to get her, and, and, uh, and I was determined to get, you know, to give the teapot its voice, so. And didn't you say she was word perfect? First Oh, yes, first, first yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So she recorded it because, you know, she's at home, so we couldn't bring her to a studio. So she just read it once, and it was absolutely perfect. Um, Real really, really special. Amazing. Um, so... Throughout the years of um, this discussion and uh, I think the collaboration between, um, I think, two institutions that we're talking about, and I'm sure it, 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 it's a collaboration also among, you know, 
a lot of departments involved. Can you tell us how many people are involved and the kind of research that you, know, you have to do in order to create this show? Well, we should also um, remember Walt Disney as well, because um, this could not have been done without the uh, Walt Disney Animation Research Library, where they have 65 million objects in their archive, most of them works on paper. Um, and uh, they were amazing partners from the very beginning and very supportive of the idea. They do exhibitions around the world, but they not really done one like this in a, in a museum like the Wallace Collection or indeed the Met, as you say, it's the first time there was a Disney exhibition at the Met. Um, so they were wonderful. So, so there was the team at, at, the, um, at the archives at Disney. Then I have to say um, that the, the Met is a, a very large and hugely professional institution and we at the Wallace Collection were very grateful to have the Met on board as well. Um, and because the show had its first iteration in New York, um, I think, Wolf, it's fair to say that you bore the, you, the Met, the wonderful exhibitions department, design department, editing department, bore the brunt of the, um, the work. Well, I think maybe in sort of administrative terms, but, but, but in terms of developing the narrative, the curatorial choices, that was very much a, a, a you know, very close collaboration between Helen and myself. Um, everything, all, all the choices that we made in terms of, of objects for both shows, we, we discussed. And obviously the selection of drawings um, for, the, uh, for the exhibition, which was slightly, there was a, a sort of almost a kind of, um, uh, I mean, what, what, what one mustn't forget is that, you know, this show was uh, prepared during COVID. I mean, I, for instance, was supposed to go to the Getty and spend three months in Los Angeles going through the Disney archives, all those drawings, none of which could happen. So, um, so it is pretty amazing how this, the, the, the both versions of the show were organized um, in Los Angeles, New York, and London without us being able mm. to pay each other a visit. It was all done via Zoom. And um, luckily, Helen, uh, who, who had um, done some research at the Getty, uh, was able to, to see uh, uh, a, a selection of the, of the Disney drawings that are now in the show, and I managed to see them before COVID. Um, but, but those two visits for us were absolutely essential mm. uh, to, to make a selection of the drawings. But they, you know, I, I know, and it's sort of... It, there, there was a sort of a forced editing process, which is probably good because, as Helen said, you know, 65 million drawings is quite a lot of drawings. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are in the archive some other drawings that would have been perfect for the show, which we never got to see. Uh, although, as, as Helen said, the, the Disney team was brilliant. In, I mean, I, I sent them emails all the time, said, do you have something like this? Do you have something like that, etc. cetera? And, um, and so they always fed us with, with um, additional drawings, but I'm sure that there are... Uh, 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 there's interesting materials, maybe for a sequel exhibition one day. <laughs> Are you listening, Dom? <laughs> yes. Um, so, the, were there any... Um, uh, well, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I should use the word disagreement, but uh, were there any uh, challenges, or what were the greatest obstacles, I mean, besides doing research during COVID? What were the greatest challenges? Well, for me um, and the Wallace Collection, I think it was editing um, an exhibition which was so much more uh, universal at the Met and, and, and bigger. And the Wallace Collection simply doesn't have that kind of exhibition space. And to have to leave things out was hugely disagreeable, actually. Um, but actually, I think... But, but, um, I think actually because it's so focused, the version of the Wallace Collection might be stronger than the, the Mets version because it really, I mean, you, you were brilliant at ed editing it down. I mean, it is amazing if you think of, of, of the surface of the space, the, 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 the Wallace Collection's gallery is about a third, if not smaller, compared to mm. the one what we had at... So it is, actually, I, I, I think that that was one of the great challenges, was, was editing. And, um, and particularly also in the writing of the, of the, of the, the two publications that we produced. Um, and um, I, I may say that, that um, this was an introduction to Helen, to, to the Disney material. I mean, it is amazing that Helen's become a total expert on, on <laughs> Disney, which, uh, if I may say, you, you weren't five years ago, but you got, <laughs> became a total expert on the subject. But, but because... So Helen was much more focused, whereas I was, you know, always thought, oh, we could build this in and that in, et cetera, and these cross-references, and then it makes it 
it's not his focus, which isn't, which isn't good. But that brings us to the set, really, doesn't it? And yes, absolutely. Um, I guess, um, well, Tom, how did the, how did you you know come up with the ideas of how to showcase um, the version of the show um, here in, in in London at the Wallace Collection? I guess we have some slides that we can. Yeah, I, I, I prepared a rather large amount of visual aids so people can, I will flick through them quite rapidly. Um, so this is me as a theatre designer. So I I'm, I'm don't normally do exhibitions, although I have uh, increasingly. I began in 2012 working on Shakespeare staging the world with Alan Farley. And Alan Farley was the co-designer on this project and, and, and nothing would be possible without him. So I have to really say that very strongly. And me and Alan worked together. Another collaboration, really. And, and Alan's more of an architect, a more experienced exhibition designer. I'm brought into projects because people like the kind of theatrical immersiveness uh, that, that people increasingly seem to want to have in exhibitions. And also, I guess I respond as a theatre designer to the objects. And for me, the objects are like the actors. And, I, and my job is to create the world in which these actors, these objects, can tell stories to each other. And so actually what I'm doing is not just displaying, but looking at how things talk to each other, the groupings and all of that sort of stuff. So. This is an exhibition I did at the Jewish Museum on blood. Uh, and then most recently, uh, the, I actually hand-painted this myself. This is Alice <laughs> in Wonderland during lockdown at the V&A. Uh, so again, that kind of the, the thing of the, the designer craftsman is something that was a part of the theme of the piece. So I look at the objects, and Helen will have to interrupt and say what every object is, because I won't remember the name of it. But, but the chronology of the exhibition kind of began with the early Disney, uh, basically the influence of France on Walt Disney. And there's a wonderful bit of video of him going to Paris and going around the Palace of Versailles. Uh, and then his very early sketches and animations were of these, these sort of dancing figurines. So we displayed those kind of alongside, uh, alongside the, the figurines kind of rotating, which was an idea that actually we did borrow from the Met. But my process was I didn't go and see, obviously it was COVID, I didn't go and see the Met show. I didn't really know about it. And actually the institution of the Wallace sort of with its uh, curatorial team sort of basically said, we want to do it for here. And obviously we referred to Helen as our portal to America. And, and I didn't really meet Wolf until you know, way down the line with a rather nerve-wracking Zoom call going, this is what we're doing, do you think this is going to be okay? <laughs> well, well, for me, yeah, well, it might not be for you, but, um, you know, when, but it, it's, well, I'll cut on to more about the kind of weird thing of designing an exhibition that then goes on and you don't design it anymore. Um, and then Helen also sent through a very handy kind of PowerPoint full of lots of uh, French interiors, interior designers, and we started to sort of look and talk about Messonnier uh, and his drawings especially. Obviously, designing di for Disney, the huge challenge is what's Disney going to say and how is Disney going to react? Uh, and am I going to have to have Mickey Mouse ears somewhere in the design? Uh, and so basically, we instinctively pulled away from the idea of using any reproductions of any of the Disney work. We wanted to treat the work solely as the drawings uh, and not as uh, you know, a blow up, a wallpaper that you would add to the exhibition. So here you get some of the, the Disney studio kind of, you can instantly, when you start looking at these drawings, see why the exhibition works, why it's so interesting and intriguing. You know, Disney starts looking at these interiors, creating sketches, animating, distorting. Uh, you get Mary Blair creating these, got it right, well done, uh, these kind of beautiful uh, animations. I came across her work on um, Alice in Wonderland as well, uh, which mm -hmm. then go into the sort of, and this learning too about the process of creating the stills and creating the layers and how the, the studio did the animation was fascinating for me. Uh, and then also beautiful things like we have 24 drawings of the transformation of Cinderella's dress. And you can see that kind of the wonderful hand-drawn animation. There's a great section in the exhibition where there are those displayed with the animation. Um, then, there, oh, the next one. then there's a whole section on the kind of architecture. Obviously, this is very familiar to kind of our Disney childhood, these wonderful castles. Uh, but then, who's this drawing by? Saint Aubin. Saint Aubin. So seeing these kind of drawings that Disney and his studio would have seen, and then seeing how he's reacted or they've reacted and responded to that, that architecture. 
and then how the decorative objects sit within that that come from the Wallace. And I think for me, not being a Wallace, uh, uh, I mean, I love the Wallace, but the fascinating thing for the exhibition is removing the objects from their Wallace context, taking them out of the floral wallpaper, the kind of grandeur, and the multiplicity of things, and actually being able to really focus, uh, and, and that word about editing and focus, I think, for me, that's what a theatre designer does, is create focus. And actually, that's what an exhibition should do, and therefore be able to create focus on objects and really celebrate them. And then the other huge aspect of the exhibition is celebrating the anthropomorphic quality that Disney saw in uh, the 18th century decorative furniture, creating uh, you know, a brilliant butler out of a clock. And here is the, you know, a very, you can just sort of see it now. And you can see there we've displayed it against uh, a much reduced kind of version of a Meissonier drawing in the space. So this was our major influence, this particular Meissonier interior, uh, which we got as high-res version as we could, and then our poor graphic designer spent a lot of time trying to refine it and kind of mm -hmm. clean up the lines, but she did a fantastic job. And then with Alan, we would start working on the grouping. So this is a ground plan with each of the walls spread around the side. It's a bit confusing to look at from above, but you can see, and this is one of Alan's great skills, is looking at where the groupings of objects go, how you bring things together, how they tell stories. And then the space that we're in, in the Wallace, is a bit of a nightmare to design for us. So it's basically what was the cellars of, of the Wallace. So it's long and low and thin, and therefore creating the journey, the narrative journey through the space uh, was really challenging. Uh, and I tend to work with small 3D models. So here I've created kind of models of the space, and you can see I'm beginning to try and break the space up with walls that kind of move you through it. Uh, and then begin to create a series of vistas as you kind of go through the space that draw you from one bit to another. So again, that kind of narrative thing. Experimenting with the Meissonier and mirrors, getting lots of different views. And then how particular objects are displayed. So this lovely little Cupid, which is? Um, L'amour falconé. Right. Uh, and this, we think, I might be wrong here, but this Cupid is the Cupid in Fragonard's The Swing. So you can just see him there on the left, and then you can see the Disney version, which we displayed as well. And then in our exhibition, we end up with the Cupid displayed in relation to the painting, so that you can get the view where you see him, and you can see him in the painting. So you're seeing those things in juxtaposition, kind of telling a story to each other. Uh, that's the swing looking out of the way. And then there are other bits of the exhibition where we used a much simpler approach where we just want to celebrate the object. So those are the Cinderella drawings that I was telling you about going on a very dark colour. And the colour scheme, we did definitely get the advice of, of Wolf and Helen on what worked for New York and what would work best for the drawings. And there you can see how we displayed those two beautiful Sev. Uh, what exactly are they? They're sort of... They're, they're potpourri vases. Potpourri vases, yes. Uh, sort of framing some rather difficult spaces in the exhibition was actually like a coal scuttle, effectively. But they were acted like the portal into that space. And again, and Helen was really keen that we could see them completely in the round, so we'd get them on all sides. And that was definitely one of your strongest curatorial guides, was making sure that we really appreciated the objects we went through. And then the final space, I introduced a mirrored wall so that you kind of got a Versailles kind of image going on and things reflected and distorted in that kind of mirrored space. And the final thing I'll quickly talk about is, the, is, the, is announcing the exhibition to the world, because it's kind of down in the basement below the cafe, and traditionally they have like vinyl banners that just hang in the space. We looked at, can, can we dress the way in and dress the door? So I played around with Meissonier, but then I also tried, would it, what would it be like if it was a Disney castle, or, uh, or one of, oh, it's got it's jammed, or one of Mary Blair's drawings. And they felt like they were creating the wrong expectation for an audience to come into the space, that you know, they would expect there would be Disney blow-ups throughout the whole thing. So in the end, we ended up creating this sort of Meissonier cutout, but again, a bit like a stage set. You're invited to come down the stairs, come through the grand doors, uh, and discover this magical kind of world within it. Go on, last one. Here we are, so that's the kind of entrance way that people come into. So there we go, that's my um, quick whiz through the kind of design process. <laughs> well, from my point of view, that was um, such a great collaboration, Tom, because 
I was introduced to you through our fabulous exhibitions department, who, who you had worked with, I think, or you knew in the past. Anyway, um, and it became clear to me really early on that you understood the, about the volume of objects. And now you're saying you treated them like actors. I get it. I really understand that, that that's what you've done. And um, from our point of view, it was wonderful to find a designer who um, understood what the point of the exhibition was. It was great. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I am biased in that I, I'm a son of an art historian, so I did grow up in museums, so I, I'm aware of the power of objects. And I guess also, as a designer in the theatre world, you are always uh, a magpie looking around at the world and trying to sort of make sense of it and bring inspirations in. Um, so, and also, I guess I'm very used to the idea, which yeah, I think is a challenge for exhibition design, but I'm used to the idea of change and things evolving and being responsive to new ideas as they, as they come up, or like we might cut that object or bring a new object on, or actually, no, we think the rooms are the wrong way around, and that needs to be, we need to begin with that bit and that way. And we definitely did a bit of that at the beginning of the process about how you begin the exhibition and, and, and how you move through it. Um, and that, for me, that's a very different approach from a more architecture driven notion of design, exhibition design, which is very like stage one, stage two, stage three, everybody signs it off. Uh, and I often find that quite a challenge because I don't like working like that, but big institutions are very keen. And that's more the nice thing in a way is working with the Wallace because it was a small enough institution with, with you uh, and Claire, the, the head of exhibition. So you weren't having, uh, and we also had the the lead of the, of the Wallace there as well. So you weren't having that problem of your ideas going up a food chain mm. and a message coming back down, we don't like that bit, change that. So that I think for me that was a, a thing that anybody who works in exhibitions could try and learn from about how to work more creatively with your designers and how to negotiate that thing with the, with the head honchos. <laughs> so um, having been to the... Um, uh, the, the, the show at the Wallace Collection. Now I'm curious how the, how the show at Met uh, looked like and how different it is, I mean, besides the, the size. Well, um, so, well, as Tom said, the, the, they had a much greater challenge in terms of the space because it is such an awkward, narrow, long corridor, whereas we had um, perfectly ordinary shaped galleries. Our challenge was, because of COVID and cuts, etc., that we were basically told we had to reuse the same walls that, um, that were already in place. And the designer, the in-house designer with whom I worked was absolutely brilliant, just inserted one wall and opened one up, and then you had a completely different uh, trajectory through the space. I don't have any images here, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so the, it, 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 didn't, it didn't produce the same challenges in terms of trying to create vistas, et cetera, because they were actually there. And, the, um, and we had to space out, because the, the Met just gets more visitors, we had to space out the works of art. Um, I mean, it was such a joy going through your version of the exhibition and seeing these things rather sort of densely hung, uh, which you know our designers would have never allowed us to do. Um, so everything was sort of uh, spaced out more. But it was, um, the, I mean, the, the challenges, and I think this is really the, 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 the point we ought to discuss is, is, as you said at the beginning, bringing together two worlds that at first me may seem absolutely um, miles apart. So you have this um, uh, these decorative works of art that are created for this for this small 18th century European elite and then you have the slate of Disney films that everybody knows and how you create a framework that brings those two worlds together so that so that they can have a, a natural dialogue um, so we didn't work with with um, with the missing year drawings in terms of blowing up, we, we had a rather wonderful thresholds between two different galleries, uh, between the individual galleries that were inspired by uh, Rococo forms and that had this sort of, the suggestion of layering that, that you find in the, in the, um, uh, in the, the cells for the films where you have the background paintings and then the characters laid in front of it. Mm. I think that brings us to um, uh, another point. Uh, another point of discussion is how to the adaptation of an exhibition. I think um, I think in the recent years, I mean, uh, 
besides, you know, uh, minus COVID, uh, we have seen more and more, you know, exhibitions, uh, international collaboration among different institutions, and they're traveling to different parts of the world. And, uh, but then every, every city, every museum is different, you know, in terms of, you know, architecture and uh, the audience space. And so I think every show, um, even if it is the, s the same show, it still has to be adapted to a, a local context in order to, you know, be, be appealing to, um, to, to a local audience. So, um, so from this experience, what do you think that um, would be the most um, crucial um, elements that, uh, that we should pay attention to or, you know, institutions should, should pay attention to in, in future, you know, organizing this kind of um, collaboration. Do you mind if I... Oh, sorry. No, I, I, I think one point that, that made it work, because, as we said, you know, we have the Met, which is a rather large museum, and the Wallace Collection, which is rather small, is that... Um, is the elasticity of this exhibition, because what was traveling, really, primarily, was the, the selection of Disney drawings that was first paired with the Met's collection of decorative arts and then paired with the Wallace's collection, local collection of decorative arts. So one of the few 3D objects that were traveling was the, the, the Sevres Tower vases. But other than that, it was primarily your collection. And the great thing about that is that it enabled uh, Helen to highlight the collection under her care, and it enabled me to highlight the, the collection under my care at the, at the Met. Um, but it also then gave us a sort of certain flexibility and elasticity in terms of, of making it move from one place to the other. And I think, um, as I, I said earlier, I think the, the, the one element that may have been different between one place and the other is that um, because of, of Disney, Disney the man, the importance of him as an American figure, the emphasis at the Met may have been greater on him and here at the Wallace more on the, on the animation of Rococo art because, it's, because the, the Wallace is the, the headquarters of Rococo. Yes, and, and um, what I would like to say about that too is that there's a difference between a collaboration, which this really was, and exhibitions which move from one place to another around the world. Because um, this was, uh, the, the two of us and our teams and, and people that we worked with were, were putting together these exhibitions um, in a hugely collaborative way. We at the Wallace Collection didn't just say we would like the Met's exhibition. So um, all the way along, um, there was this real working together. And where that happens, um, and you do get obviously other examples of it, um, I think it depends hugely on um, trust in the other party involved and, uh, um, and a sort of awareness and appreciation and respect for the other person working, or the other people working on the collaboration. Um, and I wonder if what's happening over the last few years with more and more online um, connections of course, with Zoom, we're now much more used to talking to people across the other side of the world who we've never met. I wonder if these collaborations might not get more productive, actually, because they may be, they, they, it may be easier for people to um, understand and work with people they've never actually met because they may feel that they have met them. Rather, than, We were fortunate because we knew each other very well. But it was, it was brilliant that, you know, we were then in touch. I mean, we, we had Zoom meetings almost every other week. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, and it was, no, and, and I think the, the, the trust is a, is a very important word. I mean, I, you know, you know, I was, there was not one moment where I was, I mean, from my vantage point, anyway, worried about, you know, how it might look like at the Wallace because I 100% I trusted uh, Helen. But it is exactly this. It was, it was a very strong collaboration. It wasn't just a traveling mm -hmm. show. Uh, and incidentally, I will say that um, we have been asked if we wanted to send the exhibition elsewhere, and we decided rather against it because um, I think we're also ready to move on with our lives. Aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> but also for the same reason that you said, um, the collection works so well at the Met, and it worked so well at the Wallace Collection, and that may not always be the case, and it will work well in mm. Pasadena as well. I, I've been on the experience in the design process of working on some exhibitions which were a kind of trying to be a hybrid of a collaboration or bringing a certain amount of material from another institution. Uh, and as a designer, that has been quite challenging because you're sort of going, which bits of this have I got to, 
take? Am I treating this whole video sequence or this whole interactive? Is that an object that has to be as it is in this space, or am I actually allowed freedom within it? And and the most recent students had like that. Actually, the two bigger institutions, I was a little person that wasn't really aware of that, did actually fall out completely over it, and we ended up doing our own version and, and rejected all of their their assets and created our own version. So it, it's quite a, it is quite a challenge. And, and, I, and also, as a designer, I do gall slightly, like I did Winnie the Pooh at the V&A, and then that turned up in Boston, and a friend of mine in Boston said, I've gone to your exhibition, and he went around and took all these photographs, and it was sort of a pale shadow of what we'd done, terribly lit. Um, and, and of course, I hadn't been given any credit, let alone any money, for the fact that they were using the kind of basic idea that we'd had. And I think museums do need to start looking at their kind of their creative copyright and their kind of how they actually engage with the, the more they want a more creative kind of input into exhibitions, the more it becomes its own thing that then needs to be either protected or, or managed as you go out into the world. Either that or you do the kind of lock, lock key exhibition where you turn up in containers and, and it all goes like the Van Gogh experience, that kind of thing. So that means um, this particular exhibition is quite a unique, um, quite a unique example, the way how, it's, how, how it was born and how it, how it worked and how it has, um, how it has grown. Um, so in future, if you know, other institutions were looking into doing like collaboration, so they will have to be quite choosy in terms of the, the kind of topic, uh, the subject matter and the way the way how it works, because obviously it's not something that can be done uh, a, on an everyday basis. Yes, no, I think it needs to be completely, I mean, it was a completely organic collaboration. I mean, we didn't, we didn't think about, oh, let's do a great collaboration. We just, you know, wanted to work together. I think that may be a key, actually, because sometimes um, it, it wouldn't work if you said, right, really must do a collaborative exhibition with XYZ institution. Then you're sort of grappling around for what is the subject, what is the, the story. This, this came out of the objects, um, came out of Wolf's original idea. And then I, I would say, uh, you know, my relationship with different curators, you know, you do get some curators who really are only interested in the catalogue. You know, that they sort of like, they're putting together their catalogue and their, their art historical text about everything. And then fundamentally, as long as the objects are well lit, they kind of feel, they feel hard, fine. And then others who are much more interested in the kind of the nature <laughs> of the world and how the story it tells and what colour's going to be behind that and will that actually make things look right. And, you know, uh, and, and I find that much more exciting when you're working with a creator who actually has a creative vision. You know, they want to do the exhibition. They've got the passion, and that's why they're doing it. And, and you want to be infused by their passion and their far greater knowledge than you on the subject. So you're a bit, you're a bit like a, a sort of journalist sometimes. You're trying to be, you know, gem up on, on a subject you don't know much about and, and trying to feel knowledgeable very rapidly. So we come to you. <laughs> so trust and uh, or organic... Um, growth, it seems, they seem to be the dominating themes to make sure, to, to make a collaboration like this work. Mm. Um, so on that note, maybe we can, you know, advise our um, members of the audience, if you have questions about um, this uh, exhibition or collaboration, um, and I'm sure our panelists, we are more than happy to take your questions. We'll have a microphone um, passing around, so if you have any questions, please just raise your hand. whether because the Wallace collection had this happy link to the, the Met, um, do you think that gave um, Walt Disney more impetus, if you like, to, co to collaborate with the Wallace collection? Had it just been the Wallace collection doing this exhibition, do you think it would have happened? Well, when, I, crudely, you know. <laughs> you know? Well, when it was um, first proposed, it was just the Wallace Collection. And in fact, it was back in 2018 when I was in Los Angeles and, and I went to see them. Um, and they were thrilled about it. Um, because this is pre-COVID, it was due to be 2021, wasn't it? Which was a big 100th anniv uh, yes. 30th anniversary of the making of Beauty and the Beast. 
And so Disney felt that that, that, that made a lot of sense. Um, they loved the idea of being represented in, a, in a, a museum in London, National Museum, which they obviously knew of. Um, and because there are direct links between the Disney artists and the Wallace Collection, it made perfect sense. Um, so I, I like to think that it would have definitely have gone ahead, but there is no doubt that it made a different dimension when the Met became involved, because suddenly it's in the USA um, at, at the Met, and, th and that means something very different. You, you told me that the, when they were doing Beauty and the Beast, they, they were, the animators were based quite near the Wallace and would come into the Wallace and actually do sketching there. So, you know, there was a, a really direct link. It, it wasn't a random, oh, let's do it at the Wallace Collection. Yeah. And, and you can see that in the exhibition. There are drawings in the exhibition that respond directly to the works in the Wallace Collection. Um, I have a question really for the two curators and, and Tom, if I may. Which individual is your favorite object in either exhibition, be it the Disney, um, a Disney object or an uh, art, art object? Pick one, please. And see which is your favorite. I'll let you go first. Well, um, it has to be the, uh, the potpourri vase, the pink and blue uh, potpourri uh, entouré, as it was called. 1762, um, the, the complexities of firing an object like that with different ground colors, each time there's a different firing, um, then the enamel painting, the trophies, more, paint, more firing, then the gilding could be another two or three times. And we're talking about objects, I mean, they're, they're big, they're this sort of size. They're full of um, holes. The holes are where the, the smell comes out for the potpourri. But the, the difficulty of firing an object like that is remarkable. But the fantasy of creating it um, is, is just as uh, a, a spark of imagination and creativity, just like shown by the Walt Disney artists. So that would be mine. Tom, do you want to... Oh. <laughs> putting you on the spot. Okay. Uh, well, I think I, I'll... For balance, I'll go for one of the Disney objects, and I, I think maybe maybe the Mary Blair drawing. And I think it's partly because I discovered her on Alice in Wonderland, and and just I think it was a revelation to me. And, and again, on Alice in Wonderland, about Salvador Dali working for Disney, that actually we tend to be rather snobby about Disney and assume that that, that they're just sort of you know craft. They're not, you know, they're just people who are quite good at drawing. But actually, there's, you know, he, he worked with some really brilliant graphic artists, and there's lots of lovely examples. I mean, the transformation of the Beast, the transformation of Cinderella, where the the line drawing and the graphic style is so powerful. So, yeah. Well, that puts me in an awkward position because I I was going to say the vase, um, and now you said Mary Blair. I I will say my. One object that's particularly wonderful is that selection of, of um, 24 drawings, which we use to illustrate the point that you need 24 drawings for one second of animation, which adds up to about a million drawings for each film. And we have this wall which shows the transformation of Cinderella's dress, which is said to have been Disney's favorite piece of animation. And what this illustrates is that not only is it mind-blowingly laborious, so you actually have two artists working together, uh, one animating the, the transformation of the dress and one animating each individual sparkles. Every drawing that has to be transferred onto a plastic sheet of celluloid and is going to be filled in with gouache. So it's, it's mind-blowingly laborious. But on top of that, uh, the draftsmanship is incredible. And these are really artists who are really trying to push the boundaries of their medium. So you have this incredible uh, illusion of the weight of Cinderella's gown, which she lifts up and sort of turns around. It's absolutely remarkable. And, um, and I'm so pleased that we were able to, to include that in the exhibition because it, it, it illustrates exactly the same kind of, of ambition and collaborative uh, uh, um, uh, 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 same ambition and collaboration that we see illustrated in the tower vases. Any other questions from the audience? I might use that moment of silence to obviously encourage every one of you to go and see the <laughs> exhibition and take your families and friends, etc. Because it is, as, as Helen said, you know, it's, it really is, is, I mean, it sounds so cheesy, but it is something of the whole family. And although, you know, I'm not, I'm not based here, so I don't go and see the 
who is at the Wallace Collection, but certainly at the Met, we had every age represented from very small children to very elderly people. And, and it was a wonderfully broad and diverse audience. Um, and and what's the, what I thought was particularly heartening is the fact that they, um, as I was sort of, you know, going through the galleries and watching um, uh, the, the audiences going through the, the space, is that everybody seemed to spend as much time looking at the Disney material as they were looking at the, uh, at the 18th century material. I mean, for instance, the, the Sevres Tower of Vases, just today someone said to me again how uh, their, their five-year-old child was completely mesmerized by it. I mean, they're, they're very popular with, um, with children, so it's, um, and, but also equally with, with adults. Mm. So anyway, you know, do take all your friends to go and see it. And, and the other thing, as we're plugging the show, perhaps I should say, is that um, we're lucky enough to have Don Hahn, who is the producer of Beauty and the Beast and many other uh, phenomenal Disney films, uh, coming to London later this month, and he's going to be in conversation with me at the Wallace Collection on Friday the 22nd of July. So if you're interested in, in what we've been talking about, um, please do come along and then meet a real live Disney legend. Yeah, you know, he produced The Lion King, and I mean, he's, he's a big cheese. So we have a, um, a lady in the front who have a, has a question. Sorry, the, the mic doesn't seem to be working. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the show had changed the way you see some of your objects. Um, obviously, you know your collections really well, and Tom, you probably have worked very closely with the objects. Um, but some of the comments of some of the reviews really mention when you walk out of the exhibition and go upstairs, you see the collection completely different. And I was wondering if it had had the same effect on you. I think absolutely yes. Um, I can't help but smile when I look at some of these objects, at the, the, the wit involved in, in their design, um, and, and just see them moving, really, uh, just see the animation in them. So, so, yes, definitely. Yeah, I think if you look at... It's very, it's very easy in a place like the Wallace or, or actually any museum... The, the, the temptation is that the people skip over the decorative arts because it's just a table. You know, they, they kind of go, oh, it's just a table, I'm, I'm, where's, where's the swing, where's the laughing cavalier? Uh, but actually, I think when you suddenly then see a table and look, you go, oh, my God, it's a form. Look at its legs. It's got, you know, it's got hooves and it's, it's about to leap off. And, and I, think, I think what we've done, hopefully, then makes people go back into the museum and go, oh, you know, actually, we we'll spot that and spot the, you know, Spot all the. I mean, there are many clocks we could have put in the exhibition. And, you know, there's and many other objects that could have. Um, and and then there were others like that tiny little um, uh, interior architecture thing. It's only about that big. And and in in the Wallace, it's sort of in a case, and it's sort of you'd go straight past it. So again, we gave it sort of focus. So I think it's like a, a palate cleanse for those who sometimes might find Rococo a bit overwhelming. You can go into that and really enjoy it and then come out and see the world anew. And I think also vice versa. I think that some people going through the Wallace and seeing how they feel that objects are comfortable. I mean, I remember going with a friend a couple of years ago and we were walking by the Godreau commode, the ground floor, and he said, watch it, this, you know, this, this chest of drawers is about, is about to break out in song. You know? and, oh, <laughs> and, and I think it's... it's um, it's, it's, and then when you actually then create that dialogue, you say, oh, yes, no, I, now I see it. I think it's... it's um, uh, because I think subconsciously, as people walk through the, the Wallace, they do see... I mean, it's also in the... In the, in, in the um, all those anthropomorphisms and all those associations that we, we make with, with either animals or humans uh, are, are there in the, in the language that we use to, to describe so many. You know, but obviously a table has legs and feet and, and chairs. And so it's... it's um, it's, it, it's a nice sort of, it's, um, it goes both ways, I suppose. Can we have a question from... Hello. Hi. Um, a slightly mean question. Um, oh, do you, did you do anything you regretted or would change um, if you had the chance to do it all over again? In the Very exhibition good. or Very in good. life? <laughs> all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we the exhibition obviously is absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, um, 
Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I, you know, talking about sequel, although I, I'll assure you that I, I have no intention to do a sequel to this exhibition, but one element that I think is quite interesting, I mean, what, what's great about it is when you're, when, you're, when you're putting together the exhibition, there's always a temptation to go down various routes, uh, and you have to edit it down, which I think Helen has done much better than I have, but is, is that... Um, my, my hope was that, with, especially with a, with a publication that will survive after the exhibition closes, is that it might be a starting point for others to look into these, into these parallels, to look at animation, to look at, at Rococo decorative arts. And um, one element that we did not explore in the exhibition was the whole idea of animatronics, of robots, of, of objects coming to light, actually literally coming to life, which is, which is something that uh, starts in the 18th century with the famous chess-playing Turk that was made for, for uh, Maria Theresa. And Disney himself had a great fascination for animatronics, obviously, as he was developing Disneyland. And I think that that actual animation of, of inanimate objects could have been another element that we could have included, um, although I think it would have, been, it would have then had have had that lack of focus, but if one were to do a sequel to the exhibition, I think that would be potentially uh, one sub subject that one could um, address. What? Your turn. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know about regret. It's such a terrible word, isn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, extremely grateful that the, um, the combination, perhaps, of limited space and dare I say, limited funding, uh, made us make decisions um, that I think did help pull it together for the Wallace Collection. Um, it's very easy, I think, when, when you can do anything, um, which, of course, neither of us could, but, but you know, I think it, it, sometimes it's not a bad thing to have a certain um, limitation on one's ambitions. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I'm slightly would have done differently in the exhibition would have been the Hall of Mirrors bit at the end where uh, I had spec'd it to be sort of much more actually like pa individual mirror panels and then they could have, we missed the moment where the builders out of convenience made them enormous. So I then had to go back in and hand paint in the kind of the, jo the joins of things. So there's a bit there where I kind of know it should look slightly different from it does, but I don't think anyone else worries no, about that. <laughs> but I do I agree, agree completely about the, the stomach stapling limitation on creativity. I mean, I work in theatre, we never have any money. So you're always used to how do I create something for nothing, you know, and, 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 you know, and often a lot of that you know, Peter Brook died a couple of days ago, is about creating a beautiful empty space in which people can tell stories, and that's sort of what you have to try and do. So we have a question from the middle. Yeah, I was going to actually comment on what a joy it is to see the different creativity that you bring as curators and theatre designers together to create a new um, creative um, journey together. So uh, from my perspective, it's been an absolute joy to listen to you all explaining how this came to life. Um, I did a program with Nick Park, you know, so the animatronics mm. interest me, uh, you know, the way you bring to life, that's another exciting thing. But I guess my question would be, have you, um, other than the exhibition, is there a way that this has been documented in any way um, through other visual um, information to keep this um, enjoyment of what you're doing alive rather than it just ending on the exhibition? Well, that's the moment where we pitch the two exhibition catalogues, I think. <laughs> um, so there's, there's, two, there's two publications. One is the, is the, um, the book that, that I wrote for the, for the Met's version of the exhibition. And then there's the catalogue that, that Helen wrote for the Wallace's version of the exhibition, which then, so each publication contains the, uh, the Disney material paired with the material from the local collections. Um, the audio, I don't know if your audio guide is on the Met's we uh, on the, <laughs> the Wallace the, Collections the, 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 website, yes. no it's not, no, um, but it may be after the, um, after the exhibition it may be. So we, the, the Met keeps, so for instance the whole audio guide for, for our version of the exhibition you can listen to as a podcast on the Met's uh, website and we did a, um, a, because of COVID we did, um, uh, we've introduced uh, virtual openings which are virtual tours of the exhibition so there's a half an hour tour where I lead 
visitors through the through the architecture or through the the, the, the Mets versions of the of the space and. Um, yeah, that um, works very well. And actually, since, since um, thinking about your question, I mean, Tom, maybe you and I should go around the exhibition together and um, what, explore the, your yeah. creativity in putting it together. That might be a lovely thing to have um, yeah. on the website. I, mean, well. I, I always feel that it's a shame that the catalogues always have to be produced before the exhibition actually opens. So you end up with a catalogue that doesn't necessarily respond to the world yeah. that, that you as a designer have created. I mean, very often, that's why I was very pleased to manage to do the entrance as part of the exhibition, because often the museum takes that off and that goes to the to the, the you know the graphics and the publicity department and they create the entrance way to your exhibition which is completely the wrong colour typeface and you know <laughs> doesn't link in at all. So I mean I've I've had that happen. So when I when I first started as a student I always designed the posters for my shows. So I kinda like the idea that you can move around things and but yeah the more we can try and document mm. this sort of stuff mm. and I think the key thing is obviously to capture it in photography. I mean, it's to have to have as many photographs of that space, particularly yes. from the various angles, which is what we also did for the for the Mets version of the show. Yeah, that would be great to have um, a, kind of a video documentary to have, like, yeah. to have you two, um, Helen and Tom, to go through the the show. It would it would also be you know a really nice little souvenir for those who have visited the show, like myself. Like, I can you know go back and because it was such a such a nice experience to. Um, I, I know Tom, you said that okay, it's been a nightmare to uh, design the show, but then for a, for a visitor like myself, it felt like really going through a magical journey that was, you know, well, previously. It wasn't a nightmare, it was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was a challenging space, but the, but but, still, but the, the material uh, was so strong that. You know. But it was, it was just really very nicely realised and such an amazing experience for a visitor, um, regardless of ages. Like, like when I went, there were a lot of young people in there, so I hope that more young people uh, will go to see the show. Um, and I think we are going to wrap up here. And, oh, we have one more question? Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just want to ask Mr. Butchard, Mr. Butchard, and uh, where did you get the idea originally? Is it because when you watch the Disney movies and then you saw, that you can tell that because you are expert in, in French art and you can tell that they must have uh, got some inspiration from, from the French art? Well, so full disclosure, uh, when I was little, I wanted to become a Disney animator, um, and I just didn't have the talent, so I became an art historian. <laughs> and um, I, I, so, I, um, uh, so I, I always had this great, great fascination for Disney animation. And there was, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that, is, is that, you know, um, uh, this exhibition also builds on, obviously, the research of, of, of our predecessor. It was a very important exhibition in Paris in 2006 about Disney and Europe, but that covered all of Europe, and that was very much an exhibition about here's a source of inspiration, here's what the Disney studios did. And it, while it was a, a wonderful show and great catalogue, I felt that uh, there was ample opportunity to dig deeper and and the more focused the exhibition the deeper you can can dig and so when as i think i i said earlier when i was talking to two friends and they said to me wolf you should, because i was so enthusiastically speaking about disney animation they said to me you should do a disney show i was then thinking okay well what what can i bring to the table what how can i add to this and then that's where it dawned on me that actually there were some significant parallels in, in terms of the production of 18th century decorative arts and, and Disney animation. So this is how it all started. Okay, thank you very much. But one last question uh, for three of you is, uh, uh, just now you mentioned, maybe I can see why MoMA and uh, Wallace Collection are the natural perfect home for this exhibition. But uh, I, I'm not sure whether you've ever been to China. Do you think, is there any possibility, any museums in China might have uh, become another um, home for this exhibition, you, you, and also because China has such a big market and uh, there are a lot of uh, um, fans you, as well. You're not the first person who has had that idea. <laughs> um, so we have, we've had conversations on that very subject. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Can't sadly share that at the moment. So while we um, anticipate more news, 
then um, <laughs> <laughs> we 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 now have to take we have to uh, wrap this up. Um, so well, thank you very much, um, Tom Howard and Wolf, and thank you so much for joining us here today. So goodbye. <laughs>